Thank you, Bob. Thank you for inviting me and the rest of the gang. It's a pleasure to be here. I think the last time I was at Cold Spring Harbor was about uh, 32 years old at a herpes meeting many moons ago. So it's nice to be back and... It's great to have you. And thank also John and Bruce because it was unanimous. Yes. Well, I said the rest of the gang as well. The rest of the gang as well. Uh, but I know you were the driving force. Uh. <laughs> Anyway, I wanted to say that I re, uh, my, my research really rests on uh, the laurels of many uh, people who have contributed immensely to the field of HIV, and some of them have spoken before me, and some of them will speak after me. And I'm really delighted to be here and tell you about my experience uh, in antiretroviral agents. But it all started many moons ago. I started my career as a chemist, an organic chemist working on anti-cancer drugs and then was transported across the pond, uh, thanks to Bernard Roisman and uh, my dear uncle, Andy, Andy Nahmias, who's a herpes virologist, and I uh, worked in the laboratory of Bill Prusov, and I, was in, I didn't even know how to draw the structure of a nucleoside when I arrived in the United States. But Bill was an exceptional leader, probably the grandfather of antiviral agents, and the man who actually discovered, uh, made in 1959, uh, 5 iododeoxyurotene some of you may remember this drug, it's the first FDA-approved antiviral drugs for herpes keratitis. Working with uh, Herb Kaufman at Louisiana at the time with uh, rabbits infected in the eye and then, of course, humans. And this was truly the very first antiviral agents with some selectivity. It wasn't totally selective. I had the pleasure, also, of getting to know the people at Bars Welcome and especially Trudy Ilion, who won the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 1988. And she said, it's amazing how much you can accomplish when you don't care who gets the credit. And her work, her work really epitomized that because she shared reagents with me We didn't need MTAs or CDAs or anything to be able to do work. And she would sell me powder, dry powder to try, including a cyclovir to work in my lab and being able to work on combination chemotherapy for herpes virus infections. I worked with uh, Andy and Larry, uh, Corey and others on the first study in humans with Danny King and others, um, uh, finding out that uh, acyclovir could be useful for genital herpes, and that was a really big breakthrough. Of course, there's been many renditions of uh, acyclovir going forward, uh, thanks to the work of Balzarini and others making it more orally bioavailable with alcyclovir. So again, you know, fine-tuning these drugs have made a big difference in terms of the amount of drugs that you have to give people who are infected. And of course, uh, these drugs are extremely effective and have been very successful. Um, I've, I'm really very pleased that I got involved in antivirals because I was on a terrific uh, launching pad having worked with both Bernard and worked with Andy and Bill Prusov and some of the giants in the field of uh, virology, although I was a chemist by training. In fact, there's only, I think, two bona fide chemists with PhDs in the room, John Marty and myself. And, but we worked initially on several drugs, which I'm gonna talk about today. And really, uh, other than D4T, these are truly novel molecules. They're not repurposed drugs from the cancer world like AZT was. These are completely novel molecules, a bit like the varapine, for example. And now, of course, we're gonna hear from Daria and others on integrase inhibitors. So these were totally novel compounds that uh, really had tremendous impact on the field of HIV and as well as other, other viruses. So these are the five drugs I have personally been involved with uh, from the beginning. I list them there in the collaborations among the universities. Uh, the drug companies, as well as uh, the patients that uh, took these drugs and allowed us to get uh, beautiful data to demonstrate that, uh, that these drugs are effective and safe in, in patients. Mo most of them are safe, at least. So I want to go through some of the stories, and I think you do know that uh, FTC, as well as the other nucleosides that you heard about today from Sam Broder and others, these, these compounds are phosphorylated to the triphosphate form, and these are in, uh, incorporate into a chain terminator. In the many ways they can incorporate this chain terminator, I'm not gonna to talk too much about biochemistry, but it really requires a team to discover and characterize nucleoside antiviral agents. You don't just go and call Aldrich Chemical or 
or sigma and ask for these compounds. There's a lot of work that goes into the design, the chemistry, the biology, the computational work, the modeling, the biochemical pharmacology, the antiviral testing with using robust systems, uh, like we heard today from Marty Sinclair, and the antiviral characterization in terms of resistant viruses we heard from Doug Richman, and of course, animal work and preclinical, until eventually you get to lead uh, compounds from many hits that you have. So it's a lot of work, and I'm not gonna go through the how to discover compounds, but it is important to have the proper properties. A good drug will generally possess these attributes, basically absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. These are all important things. So you don't want these drugs to work, uh, to work uh, just once, uh, basically, that they have eventually you got, when you stop treatment, you, you either get the patient uh, uh, healed or, uh, and, the, and the drug basically clears the body. You don't want it to accumulate in organs forever. You want it or ideally to be orally or uh, injection or whatever you decide. So these are important points and you don't want to emit too much uh, metabolism. The drug breaks down and clears the body too quickly before it reaches the target. So these are things that we do. So I learned a lot of my virology. I was working with Bill Prusov at the time. Um, and then when I left the lab, he, I had set up the first HIV lab at Emory. And interestingly, uh, I was able, in those days, CDC didn't have a barrier. And you could walk across CDC and you could go up to the BL4 facility and you can actually pick up a vial of HIV and take it back to Emory without any paperwork. Quite amazing in those days. Of course, today you can't even, you, they check your car, they check your hood, uh, they say, check your passport, you cannot go in, and it's incredible. So there was this uh, spirit, an incredible spirit of cooperation, because we knew we had a, a major disaster on our hand, and people were willing to collaborate and, and give us the virus. Of course, I took this virus shaking my hands, and my wife wouldn't, at the time, wouldn't even talk to me for several months, but that's another story. Uh, uh, but basically, uh, the first drug, uh, we had a very robust, we decided very early on, and thank goodness it turned out to be a virus and not some other organism, uh, because I was trained for that, and actually I had AZT in our lab at the time, probably one of the only labs in the country, because I went working with Bill Prusov, we had made AIU, another compound, that uh, didn't make it to the clinic, but uh, it actually was very useful because it proved that the viral TK was very important, and you could actually target, uh, an, uh, target the virus and not the host, uh, and that led to the discovery of cyclovir, of course. But also the same principle could be used for nucleosides like D4T. They are basically better substrates for the uh, viral polymerase than the natural polymerase. So that's, again, why you have this advantage. D4T is not the ideal drug, but at the time it served its purpose. You can see the structure on the left-hand side. And this was work done by Tai Chu Lin, a chemist in the lab who worked on the other bench when I was at Yale and Yale University and uh, Dr. Prusov, and we, uh, we worked on this compound, and I, it was tend to me actually blind, to be honest, in my lab, because we had a very robust uh, PBMC system, and I tested it, and I immediately called Bill, I said, Bill, you got something really hot here. I've never seen anything so important against HIV. And I was doing the assays myself in those days. I don't have the team I have today. And um, so we're very excited, and we quickly put out this uh, rapid communication in biochemical pharmacology. And uh, in the paper, we talked about a DDDT. And um, I got sick of saying DDDT, so it sounded like DDT, so I decided to call it D4T, and that's how the name came through. What's amazing about this compound is that even today, uh, or at least three years ago, I should say, over a million individuals still take this drug, despite its problems. It's not the greatest drug in the world, but it served its purpose. I said the same way as AZT served its purpose at the time, and was, it was a thymidine kinase-dependent drug like AZT, and at the time that was an important uh, drug when it first came out, and many combination studies were done with D4T. And of course, uh, combining AZT with D4T was not a good idea because they both use the same enzyme, if you remember, work done by uh, uh, several people in clinical trials. It failed in, in the lab and it also failed in the clinic. But the real revolution really took place when we, uh, we discovered that uh, the, what we call today the L nucleosides. And these are basically mirror images of, uh, of compounds. You have uh, your left hand and your right hand. Uh, they are not superimposable. And you also have 
uh, shells, for example. You can see a shell there, uh, mirror images of shells. They're not mirror image, actually. You can find shells going one way or the other. Maybe on a different planet, it will grow differently. But on this planet, that's the way they, they are. And it's very interesting how the structure occurs for these shells. I'm not a uh, oncologist, but, uh, but this is something that uh, can be studied by other people other than myself. But basically, we had, we had mirror images of compounds. And we understood very quickly that, the, um, that these compounds could be phosphorylated, and both the D and the L isomer, the D being the uh, natural one and the L being the L, so what they called unnatural. But really, it's not that unnatural because in the literature, if you look at the literature, a paper I published a couple of years, many years ago, with a, with a postdoctoral fellow, uh, it was actually a review article um, looking at L nucleosides, and we had found that L adenosine actually was found is a natural compound. So there is in nature L nucleosides. It's not something totally foreign to this planet. Maybe on another planet it's all L, but here plants use it as a chemotactic agent. And in fact, they, uh, Dr. Holly, who we'll hear more about, Anthony Holly, the great scientist from the Czech Republic, he actually worked on the synthesis of L-adenosine and he actually published the paper on the, on the uh, synthesis of how to make l nucleosides, which is actually fundamental work on how to do this work, led, I believe, strongly to the discovery of 3TC and FTC later on. So I think he's not, he's being remembered specifically for his work on tenofovir and other drugs, but I think he really did his work, early work, contributed to the discovery of 3TC and FTC. Uh, in 1986, I went to England to see my old mentor at Bath University, and I told him, can we make a dioxalate? Can we synthesize uh, oxothiolate? And he said to me, it's impossible. You're wasting your time. Why, Why is it impossible? I said, well, you have a carbon with two oxygens attached to it, or oxygen and sulfur, and that's not going to be stable. So historically, if we look at this, so basically everybody shied away from making these type of compounds because they thought they were impossible to synthesize. If you ask any chemist back in 1986, 87, 88, even 89, um, they would say, you're crazy, don't waste your time, it's not going to be funded if you write an NIH grant, you definitely are not get funded. <laughs> because they say it's impossible to make these type of compounds. The, the, these um, oxothiolines were actually used as protecting agents, and we knew that under ad acidic condition, they are easily cleaved, and uh, you, you open up the ring. But what people didn't realize is that you have a cyclic system, and the cyclic system produces uh, unfavorable uh, molecule, molecule that you can see there in the middle, bot uh, bottom middle, that is uh, not, not, uh, not favorably uh, chemically. So basically the ring uh, goes back, the reaction goes back to the left-hand side instead of moving forward to the right-hand side and opening it up. So we thought it was impossible, and even I thought it was impossible, until I went to Montreal and I saw a beautiful paper presented by Dr. Belon and colleagues in Canada who actually had made dioxalanes and it made BCH-189, which was at the time was a 50-50 mixture that nobody seemed to know how to separate. And um, this is, eventually this compound was tested in culture by Mark Weinberg. His picture is shown there, a nice picture of Mark Weinberg on the bottom. And he um, published a short paper showing that BCH-189 was active. That actually was a racemic mixture of BCH-189. But the big puzzle is how to make this compound and how, how, what, what isomer is really uh, the active form of the molecule, because there are two possible uh, isomers. There's the plus, plus isomer and the minus, sorry, the plus enantiomer and the minus enantiomer. And there's also actually two other forms, the trans and versus the cis of the nucleoside. So working with uh, Dennis Liotta at Emory and Uwe Choi, we uh, made actually all the four isomers of BCH189. So although Belieu had actually made the racemic mixture, we actually made all the isomers, and we demonstrated for the first time that, uh, that the minus enantiomer was not toxic. Actually, it was very interesting. Uh, the plus is toxic, especially in CEM cells, but not in others, not many other cells. Bone marrow toxicity was quite high with the, with the plus enantiomer, but not with the minus. And that was really the beginning. We published that uh, in antimicrobial agents chemotherapy. So with that discovery, so we, 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 we discovered that there was a less toxic form, and also people at Glaxo at the time who had licensed the drug from Biochem Pharma also demonstrated the similar results at the unnatural enantiomer 
uh, has a much improved uh, profile in sleeping cell culture. Uh, what was important, and we mentioned that earlier, is process chemistry. Everybody can make a beautiful compound, and you can make maybe three milligrams in the lab, but now you have to scale it up, so you need process chemistry, and you need process chemists. And we were not process chemists, but we pretended to be process chemists, and Dennis and myself, and we decided to develop a process for making BCH189 and to resolve the enantiomers, which allowed us to do the previous experiments. And what I can tell you is that we were successful. We actually licensed our process to Glaxo, and they made four tons of BCH189 using our chemistry that was developed at Emory University. And with that, that allowed them to proceed with the clinical trial. So we probably cut down. Remember, they would have to, they would have four possible isomers when you make this compound, and they would have to throw three of them to get the right one and separate them. So that was really a coup, a coup de grace that the small university, relatively small university, could actually compete with the big pharma at the time. Uh, 3TC, as you know, and, and, and we'll hear more about that, was now used for many uh, drug combinations. Uh, Combivir, of course, was the first one, Ebzicom and Trisivir. And I'd like just to divert for one minute, if I may, on the story of 3TC and, and AZT. When the trials on 3TC were being carried out uh, in, all over the world, one patient uh, acted, well, intentionally uh, took AZT in combination with 3TC. And we actually presented that at the meeting, at the national meeting, demonstrating that for the first time that the combination, at the time everybody was doing monotherapy, as you may remember, and of course 3TC very rapidly develops resistant virus, so that's a problem. But this patient was smart enough, smarter than some of the clinicians, in actually using AZT that he had left over from a previous study and added to 3TC. And I can tell you my poster, it was a poster presentation, was mobbed uh, by the drug companies and many people because this was actually the very first time somebody had used a combination chemotherapy uh, and, and we had uh, found out about it. So that's just a side story which I think is interesting. Um, so let me just move. So let's talk about chemistry. I know you're not all chemists, but I'm going to try and explain it to you because I think it's very important to understand how, a bit, how about serendipity really plays a role sometimes. And luck, I'll take luck whenever I can. The chemistry, the, a lot of the chemistry was developed by Dennis and myself with a postdoctoral fellow, probably the luckiest postdoctoral fellow. He was a Korean guy, Korean, Korean scientist uh, in, our, in Dennis's lab, and we worked together trying to come up with a synthetic process for making uh, the compound. And this work actually was published in JAX. You probably don't even know what JAX is, German American Chemical Society. It's a science paper for chemists. That's where they go to publish their most important work. They don't go to science to show this. They show how brilliant they are in chemistry. We weren't that brilliant, actually. We, were, we weren't that brilliant, but we came upon this process by accident because the young scientist didn't understand that the, the value of Lewis acids, which are critical for the coupling reaction between the sugar part, the sugar moiety, and the base. But he didn't have any reagents, but he came to my lab and picked up stannic chloride, which I happened to have on my shelf, and used stannic chloride. And lo and behold, much to his surprise, he had a 200 to 1 excess of the right enantiomer. So it's pure luck. Uh, and we couldn't explain it why initially, we couldn't explain it. But of course, we saw it brilliantly in the paper how we did it. Uh, we, 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 saw this, uh, we, we hypothesized that the stannic chloride binds to the sulfur and forces the base to come from the top, and that's how, it, how the drug works. So this was the, the really uh, breakthrough that allowed us to make large quantities of these molecules, but not only these molecules, but many other analogs. It didn't take long to make analogs of these compounds. And, and then for, after that, we made a, 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 a basically a... Um, a prodrug of, of this uh, racemic uh, BCH189, and using uh, enzymology, we're able to separate the two enantiomers, because one enantiomer would be, there was another way of doing it too, by the way, is, is using deoxidine deaminase. Deoxidine deaminase uh, basically reduces the amino group to an oxygen, and you make the O, the, the, instead of making the cytidine analog, you make a uridine analog, and the uridine analog is not active, but you can separate very easily the cytidine analog from the uridine analog. That was key. And I'm sorry for boring you with all the chemistry, but I think I want you to tell you sometimes luck does happen. 
And of course, the story of FTC is very complicated because F3TC was way ahead, almost, almost unapproved, and we were still pushing FTC. And people told us that FTC would never work because it would get cleaved, you would form 5FU, 5FU would be toxic. Well, all the, again, science came to bear, and science, science proved to us that the cleavage reaction that everybody thought would happen did not happen with FTC, and the drug was very stable. In fact, we well know about it now. So the drug came from Emory to Baras Vulcan, back to Emory, back to Triangle, and eventually ended up in the, in, in Gilead, with Gilead. So that's, uh, that's a, the path, a very complicated path. And there's been talk about are they equal, these two drugs are equal, are they equipotent, all this stuff, discussion, it doesn't really matter. I think the bottom line is they're both, uh, we know that the triphosphate level, at the triphosphate level, the FTC is about 10 times more potent than the 3TC at the enzyme level, but it really doesn't matter too much. It may matter in terms of resistance. Probably that fluorine adds a bit more hydrogen bond, and that's probably why the compound works the way it does. One of the major surprises to us you know, it's obvious now the M184 mutation, which at the time I called the mother of all mutation, the active site of HIV, um, was, um, was discovered in our lab with collaboration with uh, John Manners because I couldn't believe my data. So I sent uh, some powder to John and said, please repeat my work and see if you can get it. And lo and behold, he was able to select a uh, virus with, with the M184 mutation. And we now understand better uh, why this occurs, and we understand the clash that occurs in the polymerase uh, when you have a sulfur ring versus an oxygen or versus a CH2 group. And that uh, led to the mutation, which is well known. It wasn't just a few fold increased resistance, but over a thousand fold in, independent of what's assay you use. So that was a fundamentally important discovery because that also led to the idea of combination chemotherapy. We have one single mutation being selected. If we hammer it with another drug, possibly uh, that could be a wonderful combination. One of the side effects of working with these uh, drugs was that we thought, well, these compounds work against the polymerase. Why can't we test them against HBV? At the time, there was nobody, not many people in the country who could actually test for hepatitis B activity in vitro. So we sent some of the powder to Tommy Chang at Yale and he was able to confirm that these compounds, both FTC and 3TC, were active against uh, hepatitis B. So that actually became, as you know, uh, 3TC became the first orally available hepatitis B drug. And work also, I should give credit also to the people at Barnes Welcome. Uh, so this is Chang's paper at PNS. And Barnes Welcome also scientists also discovered the activity of 3TC and FTC uh, with the Emory group and published almost within a, within a few months from each other. And, um, and that was really important because we had a compound now that had dual activity against HIV as well as HPV for the first time, which was very, very exciting. Another compound that came from, the, from my work as well as the work of uh, Dr. Sumadosi at UAB and eventually uh, a company that we co-founded, Dynex Pharmaceutical, uh, but was telbivudine. This compound is not even an analog. It's just thymidine. It's the L isomer of thymidine. So you can't even call it an analog. And this compound is approved for the treatment of uh, hepatitis B today as an oral drug and is used widely in China. But unfortunately, it has the same profile as 3TC and FTC. But it is a B-class uh, molecule, and it can be used in pregnant women. That's one of the advantages. So that was one of the nice uh, dividends of working uh, on these L-nucleosides. And I'm sure uh, you know all the story of Savaldi. That's not an L-nucleoside, it's a beta D analog. Uh, with the story of hepatitis C uh, polymerase. This was also uh, an amazing experience of uh, working on nucleosides. We knew that there is no latency with HIV, therefore we could develop a nucleosides that could work uh, selectively. And, uh, and, and uh, we, the first compound we wor worked on was a compound called PSI6130. And that compound uh, became mericitabine. And of course, subsequently, uh, we discovered that uh, the PSI6130 monophosphate is um, deaminated to the monophos to the mono U analog, and the U analog, well, the triphosphate form, is active against uh, hepatitis C virus, and that was quite exciting because uh, it led to the uh, modification and ability to um, deliver uh, the U analog intracellularly using a phosphate prodrug for the for it, I think uh, that was uh, using a McGigan type of chemistry, the, but the warhead was actually discovered 
uh, earlier uh, by a group, uh, a young bachelor, uh, I think he has a master's degree, Jeremy Clark, uh, chemistry in my group, who made uh, the first couple of milligrams of a compound. And subsequently, uh, we had to make large quantities of these compounds. And I can tell you the cost, uh, we talked about, uh, about making compounds, it cost us almost a million dollars a, ki a kilo of uh, 6130 to make at the time, and it was a very high risk uh, proposition. We actually had to make three, three kilos of this compound. It wasn't easy. The process chemistry of making this compound is not, is not easy. But fortunately now, they can make it in la very large quantities because it has uh, fluorine and a methyl group at a two prime position. And of course the prodrug now with, uh, with a phosphate prodrug that, uh, that becomes the drug phosphate that's a curative uh, therapy for hepatitis C virus, which is quite very, very exciting. So looking ahead, and I'm almost finished, um, nucleosides are the first line agents for emerging viruses and also, so this is something that we looked at. In fact, we've seen it happen recently with the Ebola outbreak. I don't know if John is gonna talk about it, but uh, one of our HCV compound that didn't make it uh, was repurposed for the treatment of, hepat of uh, Ebola virus, and it seems to be quite potent, unfortunately, well, for, it will come back, so don't worry, the, drug, the virus will come back and we'll be able to use it again in a larger number of people. But certainly nucleosides are becoming quite exciting for West Nile virus, dengue virus, Zika virus. And of course we shouldn't forget HIV, there's still hope for additional nucleosides and we'll hear more maybe from Daria on EFDA, a wonderful drug that, uh, that has a tremendous potency. But I think the ultimate goal is to develop a broadly active uh, nucleoside analog that will work against all viruses, and we're beginning to work on that in our lab. We talked uh, today about inflammation and immune modulators. We are also working in this area in terms of for so-called cure. Uh, and of course, uh, the ultimate goal of having been so successful with hepatitis B, with, uh, uh, with the nucleosides that are currently available, it's time to develop uh, other compounds like capsid inhibitors, and we have very potent compounds in this class of compounds and we hope to combine them with nukes uh, and get very powerful effect and maybe even have an effect on, uh, on CCC DNA, which could be quite exciting. So this is uh, where we are. Now the big uh, present of all this work, the real present is not, uh, the, re uh, the big reward that we've had is really saving lives, which is uh, something we all try to do. We've seen some horrible pictures today of patients uh, with blisters, with uh, uh, redness with conjunctivitis, severe conjunctivitis, I mean, uh, but to think that these small molecules, these small pills can actually make a difference and save and, and control and even cure some patients, that to me is very gratifying. And I can tell you that more than 94%, if not more, of the treated HIV infected persons today take a nucleoside analog. So the story started with AZT, but it's not finished. There are many more drugs to come in terms of nucleosides analog in the future, not just for HIV and HPV and Ebola, but many other emerging viruses. I'd like to just end by first uh, thank the NIH for their support for many years, the Department of Veterans Affairs for almost uh, 35 years. Uh, funding and of course my group which is composed of uh, a lot of uh, biologists but also the ones in blue are all chemists and it's important to recognize the, the chemists who actually make these molecules, uh, a, a very creative chemist in, in my lab and other people's lab who, who bring out these amazing molecules that have tremendous impact. Uh, I know the glory is in the biology but certainly the chemists should also get uh, some praise and we want to thank uh, patients who participated, as I mentioned earlier, but also I think very important, we shouldn't discount that the private public sectors for assisting the academic enterprise. I'm still a professor at Emory University. People think I work for companies. I never work for a company. Uh, I'm always uh, working still at Emory University and I'll probably uh, remain there until my last breath. But basically this is where uh, action is taking place. We can discover drugs in university settings. We can be very successful. And that hopefully gives hopes to some of the young people in the audience. Thank you very much. I have, a, I have a question. So, I mean, polymerases are just fantastic targets. Of course, reverse transcriptase is the central drug target for HIV. Um, but sofosbuvir 
it's just, you know, I, it, it's such a knock it out of the park drug. Given the incredibly high viral loads that you have with HCV, how, how does it work so incredibly well? I think first you have to have the warhead and then you have to have the delivery system. So I think the, the genius is both in the warhead and the delivery system. Delivery system was actually um, discovered, which, we, which actually was used for Sovosphere, uh, fortunately by McGigan, who died recently, as you may know, in Glasgow, a, a great sci chemist also in England, in the UK. And, um, and at least uh, Wales is still part of England, so we'll see what happens. Uh, but anyway, um, but anyway, I think, I think this was the key because the drug itself, there's, two, there's several points. First, the drug is absorbed through the intestine intact, gets to the liver, so it targets the liver, and it actually breaks down primarily in the liver, primarily in the liver. So you have a high concentration of the monophosphate form, what we, call, what we used to call PSI 6206 which is the uridine analog monophosphate. Uh, the, the, the monophosphate of 6206, sorry, 6206. So um, that compound is actually the active form and then it phosphorates the triphosphate form. Interestingly, the U analog, if it was to break down back to the U analog, there was the 6206, go back to the nucleoside, monophosphate to the nucleosides with alkaline phosphatase or whatever enzyme or phosphodiesterase, the actual molecule is innocuous. It's not active. It is totally inert. And that's what makes it so specific. Uh, so it's pretty unique. You actually take a drug that is totally inactive, you make a prodrug, and it's active. And not only is it active, but it has a longer half-life. Uh, than, than the C analog, triphosphate, intracellular half-life, you can give it once a day, as you well know. And that's why the drug is so powerful, I think. You can concentrate it. Unfortunately, it can't go very high. People don't know that, but if you take sophosphorine culture to very high levels, uh, 50 micromolar or more, you start seeing uh, mitochondrial toxicity and other problems. And it, I'm not going to spend my time or my life figuring out why, but clearly it does have toxicity at high levels. So you can't really push the dose. The dose right today is 400 milligrams. Maybe, maybe other people can speak to it, but I don't think you can, at least for a prolonged period of time, you cannot jack up the dose to, say, 800 or, or 1,600 uh, milligrams a day. So that's the problem with this drug. So, but <laughs> why is there no resistance? Oh, that was actually work done by Daria Hazudas and his, her group. Uh, we dem they, she demonstrated, her group demonstrated that, published even before the discovery. So they were playing like Larda did with HIV, making side direct mutants, seeing what's going to work, what's not going to work, whether this is going to occur. Typical virologist and doing side direct mutagenesis. And they were able clearly to demonstrate that, um, that the virus is highly debilitated. It's not that you can't get the uh, resistance. The, the key mutation for these nucleosides is S282T, changed it uh, from S to T. And that was the, the, the fingerprint for this particular uh, uh, class of nucleosides. There are other mutations, but this was the primary one. And the virus is heavily debilitated. It can happen, but it doesn't persist. It doesn't stay. A bit like the M184V in HIV. Comes and goes. It doesn't stay forever. Maybe it stays in the reservoir. That's a different story. Great, thank Done. you.